Today we continue in a series that we have entitled Reverence, Walking Humbly Before Your God. Now in way of review, if you are new with us, this will catch you up real quick. Week number one, we talked about fearing the Lord, the importance of fearing the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we said, start here, stay here, and be crystal clear on this point, not only in your own life, but in the lives of those that you are able to influence. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Week number two, we talked about reverent worship. What does reverent worship look like? Well, it's repentant worship. Reverent worship is repentant worship. Uh, Psalm 51 says, the sacrifices that God desires are a broken and contrite heart. These he will not despise. Whenever you come to the Lord with a repentant heart, you are coming with a reverent heart. And then last week, we talked about the dangers of taking lightly that which God takes seriously. We, if it's serious to God, it's serious to, uh, serious to us. If it matters to him, it matters to us. And that is where we have been. So if you missed any of those messages, you can find them online or on our YouTube page. So a common theme throughout the Bible is this, be strong and courageous. And that is because there is nothing easy about living for the Lord in this lifetime. Life is tough all by itself. But then when you, when you serve the Lord and you seek to please him, it becomes all that much more difficult. Because when you stand for the Lord, the world will often stand against you. And that can come from people at your work, people in your neighborhood, or people in your own family. Thus the need for the Bible to constantly remind us, be strong, be courageous. Perhaps one of the most famous examples of somebody being told to be strong and uh, courageous is none other than Joshua. Joshua, of course, took over from Moses when Moses died as they led the people out of Egypt. Joshua 1, 6 and 7, just as an example, says this, be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous, being very, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. And then just two verses later, he reiterates that. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Of course, this is perhaps one of the more famous ones, but not the only time that we see this exhortation to be strong and courageous. It's everywhere throughout the Bible. Let me give you some examples. Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. And the reason I highlight that is because the world is telling us we don't know what a man or a woman is anymore. Well, the Bible does. Men act a certain way. We have testosterone. We're to be strong and courageous. Amen? Amen. Act like men. Men act a certain way. We're strong and courageous. Ephesians 6, 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And then one last one, 2 Timothy 1.7, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. And here is why that is so important. Because those that we read about in the pages of the Bible that were the most courageous or did what was truly heroic or stood tall in the face of incredible evil all had at least one thing in common that I can see. And that was their strong underlying reverence for the Lord. It didn't matter who the person was or the circumstances they were facing. If they were reverent, they were immovable. As a result, the people that we're going to look at today left an undeniable mark in their respective generations in which they lived. I think a very powerful example of this can be seen in what happened when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Of course, Pharaoh was the most powerful man in the world. At the time, the first, one of the first great empires was the Egyptian empire. But as the Israelites were in the land, they began to, the Bible says, multiply and multiply and multiply. They were a fertile people, okay? They were like gerbils. They just kept multiplying. <laughs> and this is where we pick up the story because one of the most evil decrees in the history of the world came at this time in world history. Exodus chapter 1, church, hear the word of God this morning. But the more they were oppressed, that is the Israelites, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, 
one of whom was named Sapphira and the other Paua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. Imagine being these midwives facing the most powerful man at, the, at that time in world history, telling them to slaughter innocent young babies. Needless to say, these women were in a very difficult set of circumstances for to disobey Pharaoh would have meant immediate death, just as obedience to Pharaoh would have meant great reward. What did these women end up doing? Just this. But the midwives, and everybody say it with me, feared God. The midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can come to them. <laughs> and that very well may be true. Now, when we read a passage like this, it is easy to lose sight of just how incredibly courageous these two women are. They have such a deep-rooted reverence for the Lord, they stand up to the most powerful man in the on the face of the earth at that time. And they were willing to sacrifice their own lives to save the lives of these children. Who does that? You want to know who does that? Two women like this. Two women that fear God can change the world. Their deep-rooted reverence was not only the source of their courage, but the basis of their reward. God was so pleased with them, he rewarded them greatly. So God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. These two women were the reason, one of the key reasons, the Israelites continued to flourish. And because the midwives, and there it is again, feared God, he gave them families. You see, it doesn't matter who you are or what circumstances you are facing, when you revere the Lord, you can change the world. When you revere the Lord, you can change your family, you can change your neighborhood, you can change your place of work, you can change your community, you can change your country, you can change the world. You can be two obscure midwives living 3,500 years ago from this very day and change the world. Folks, there will never, ever be a shortage of opportunities to do what is right in a fallen and wicked, wicked world. We live in a fallen and wicked world. Thus, those who revere the name of the Lord and step out courageously for him can do great things. And by the way, the courageous thing that is before us won't always be the most dramatic thing. Sometimes when we stand strong for the Lord because we revere him and we serve him only, it's going to be done in places, maybe behind closed doors or places where nobody sees. It's not always going to be a dramatic thing, but it'll be a thing that God notices and respects in your life. Speaking of obscure people, we go from two obscure women to three obscure men. The only reason many of us are familiar with the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is because of their incredible reverence, which resulted in their courageous stand against another powerful world ruler. Now, if you don't know who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, here's what you need to know. God led the Israelites up out of Egypt. Josh, Moses led them out. Joshua led them into the promised land. And there they stayed for a while. But they were disobedient. And so God raised up the Assyrians. And the Assyrians, so world empires, you can follow the world empires right through the Bible, the Egyptian empire, followed by the Assyrian empire. The Assyrian empire came and conquered part the northern part of Israel and took them off into exile. Babylon conquered the Assyrians. And they came down and got the remainder of the Jews, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin in the southern kingdom and took them off. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were a part of the group that was taken off into exile into Babylon. They were God-fearing men who were seeking to remain faithful as exiles in a very pagan nation. Things become especially difficult when a proclamation was made to worship a golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. Again, church, hear the word of God. Two obscure women to three obscure men. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the, the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, which is like a, it's like a, I had to look it up, it's, um, it's like a guitar, a harp, a bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. 
Now, let me just stop for one minute. I think of all the ways to be threatened with death, one of the worst would be being burned alive. Is anybody with me on that? I mean, that just sounds horrible. If you're going to threaten me, you threaten me with that one. You can, you can kill me a million other ways, but don't do this. Uh, it is perhaps one of the most terrifying ways I would think of dying. That threat alone would be enough to get many to compromise, but not these men, not even close. These men will only bow the knee to one, and that is the Lord God Almighty. Here's what the Bible says. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Let me ask you a question. Who does something like this? Who stands up to the strongest, most powerful world, em world leader at the time and says something like this to his face? I'll tell you who. Three obscure men who revere and fear the Lord. That's who. That is who. These men would rather die than even show the slightest bit of reverence to this golden image. They won't tip the hat. They won't say anything. It's no. It's an absolute hard no. And with the two midwives we read, have just read about, it's easy to lose sight of just how courageous these men are. Standing up to the most powerful man in the history, uh, in the, in, on the face of the planet at that time, which only highlights the, the point of this message, you guys. Those that were the most courageous, who did what was truly heroic, stood tall in the face of incredible evil, all had one thing in common, at least one thing in common. They revered the name of the Lord. They did not fear men, they feared God. And they walked reverently and humbly before him. God, like he did with the midwives, honors the reverent heart of these obscure men, these three obscure men, with perhaps the most spectacular display of divine deliverance in all the Bible. Listen to what I'm about to say. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who will not bow the knee to this golden image, are rewarded by standing in the presence of the pre-incarnate Christ in all his glory. How is that for a reward? Church, hear the word of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. And I want you to notice the change that comes to Nebuchadnezzar in this passage. That Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. And the expression on his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And you would think about this. Let me just stop right here. Why would he bind them in this way? So that when they fell in the fire, they couldn't protect their faces or do anything. They were at the mercy of the fire. It would have been brutal. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Now listen to this. Then Neb King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. Let me stop for a second and say this. Folks, when you, how do you get the most powerful man in the world? How do you get his jaw to drop to the floor? Here's how you do it. You revere the Lord no matter the cost to you. Amen? You stand for the Lord. You revere him. You fear him no matter the cost to you. And when you do that, even the most powerful man in the world, his jaw will hit the ground. The king, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Incredible. These men will bow, not bow the knee to the golden image and are rewarded by standing in the presence of the pre-incarnate Christ in all his glory. Incredible. Now, I am not suggesting that God will always deliver or immediately reward those that fear his name and walk reverently before him. I actually want to highlight something I said in one of the sermons earlier in this series. Remember in the book of Malachi, it says that the names of those who feared the Lord were written on a scroll of remembrance. Let me read it to you again. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. 
And the book of remembrance, a scroll of remembrance, was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. Incredible. Now, our names still being added to that scroll to this day, I don't know. But I do know this. God has regard for those who fear him. He hears them. He sees them. He listens to them. He notices them. Those that revere him and walk humbly before him, he's got his eye on that person. The point is simply this. Whether or not God delivers us in times of difficulty, the fact is when we fear him and walk reverently before him and step out courageously, uh, we, we walk reverently before him and step out courageously for him, he is definitely watching. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we read about them in the book of Daniel. And we cannot talk, talk about the book of Daniel without talking about the name of the man, the, the man who, whose name is on that book, and that is Daniel himself. Daniel, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, was a man with a deep reverence for the Lord, which led him to do something that was courageous beyond belief. Daniel found himself in a slightly different yet very similar situation as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So track with me real quick. The Egyptian empire is the world empire, but it soon wanes and here comes the Assyrians. The Assyrian empire is conquered by the Babylonians. They come down and take the, the, it, the Jews, the remaining Jews, off into exile. The Babylonians are eventually conquered by who? The Medo-Persian Empire, the Persian Empire, that is modern day Iran. The Persian Empire become the big boys on the block. And it is under the Persian Empire that the Jews are eventually allowed to come back. Who conquered the Persians? The Greeks. That is Alexander the Great. So you can follow the world empires right down through the Bible. The Bibles, you can. Who conquered the Greeks? It was the Romans. After the Romans, you have the Ottoman Turks and so on and so forth, all the way to the British Empire, all the way up to where we are today. But eventually the Medo-Persian the Medo Empire, the Persians conquer the Babylonians and Daniel is now in a different empire with a different king, King Darius. He was under Nebuchadnezzar. Now he's in a different kingdom, part of a different kingdom under a different king, King Darius. Now King Darius liked Daniel. Daniel distinguished himself. He was an incredible man. And Daniel so distinguished himself that the other um, high-ranking officials in the Persian Empire despised him. Because he wasn't one of them. And yet the king adored him. So they looked for a plan to find fault with him. But he was so incredibly honorable, they could find no fault with him. So they came up with an alternative plan. This plan. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes a petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, this is King Darius, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the injunction. And here's what's important to note. When the king signed this type of injunction, even he couldn't overturn it. So they didn't, he didn't know that they were using this to trap Daniel, whom he truly had favor for. But once he signed it, Daniel's fate was doomed. But you know what type of Daniel uh, man Daniel was? This is verses 7 through 9. You know what verse 10 says? This is what verse 10 says. It tells us a lot about who Daniel was. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he panicked and ran to the king. He ran to his friends. He was out of control. No, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. And he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done what? Previously, this was a man that regularly bowed the knee to the Lord and he did it with open windows. He was not ashamed of it. Anybody could see him. It was on public display. He served one God and he worshiped him regularly. And folks, that's significant. It is the man or the woman who daily bows the knee before the Lord who is the one that is going to have the courage to stand strong in times of trouble who is going to do that which changes the world, changes the generation that they're living in. Now, if you know anything about Daniel, this shouldn't surprise you. Daniel has a long history of revering the Lord. When Daniel was first taken off into Babylon, he was to be put on a new diet. But he refused. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him 
not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Daniel was a reverent man. It was on display at all times and in all ways. There was no way that he was going to bow the knee or defile himself in any way, shape, and form while he was an exile in a foreign pagan country. If it cost him his life, it cost him his life. He revered the Lord no matter the cost to him. Now, back to our story with Darius. Daniel's reverence before the Lord sets up one of the most memorable events in all the Bible. Daniel in the lion's den, right? We all know about it. We all heard about it. We all studied it as kids. Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. Darius doesn't want this to happen, but he can't stop it. The next morning, Darius runs to see what happened to Daniel. And what happened? Surprise, surprise, God shows up. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. And they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Again, will God always deliver us when we rock reverently before him? and step out courageously for him? Not necessarily, but of this you can be sure, God has regard for those who fear him and walk reverently before him. He does. As a matter of fact, I would argue that as Christians living in this generation, the new, much of the New Testament, is sim- the message is simply this. First Peter and much of the New Testament is this, prepare to suffer, prepare to suffer. Walk reverently before the Lord and prepare to suffer. It doesn't mean that God um, doesn't see God will always see you when you fear him and walk courageously for him. But prepare to suffer. Times will get tough. Times will get perilous. And it won't always be easy as Christians. But know this. It's worth it. It is worth it to serve our God no matter the cost to us. To proclaim to the world we will not bow the knee to the gods of this world or the rulers of this world. We serve one God. We serve one king. Amen? Amen. And that's why, precisely why I said those that have proved to be the most courageous, the most heroic, the most incredible in the face of evil all had that one thing in common. They revered the Lord. Now, where does that leave us today? Well, guess what? Babylon isn't gone. How do I know that? Because we find Babylon in the book of Revelation. Church, hear the word of God. A Babylon is alive and well. After this, I saw this is the destruction of Babylon. So this is talking about the destruction of Babylon, which means Babylon's still around. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Now, there is much debate as to the identity of Babylon. You're, depending on what theologian you're listening to, what commentary, commentator you're reading, people are going to say it's the United States, it's Russia, it's whatever. I'm going to give you my two cents, and you can take it for whatever it's worth. I personally think that Babylon is a reference to the evil worldly system that has always been opposed to Christ down through the centuries. There was physical Babylon, but there is another type of Babylon, and that is the evil world system that is opposed to Christ. The spiritual, political, and economic realms that are opposed to Christ. Babylon has been alive in every generation, and its destruction is coming. In other words, if it is in the world and opposed to Christ, it is part of Babylon. So when you turn on the TV later today, and you turn on the news, and you see all the crazy stuff that's happening in the world, you want to know what that is? That is Babylon being Babylon. <laughs> Amen? That's, you can just tell yourself, that's Babylon being Babylon. Babylon is raging. I will often turn on the news, and I'll be like, Babylon is raging. Babylon is raging. But what I want you to notice, even more importantly, is just how wicked Babylon is. Listen to this. She has, look at the red part, she has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit. Incredible, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. And I should have kept going with the red. For the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. 
Babylon is exceedingly wicked. Now, why is that important? Because this is Revelation 8, 1 through 3. You know what the next two verses say? 4 and 5? It says this. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out from her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Folks, if you get nothing from my message today, get this. Daniel, along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are not the only ones who are called upon to stand strong in the face of the wickedness coming out of Babylon. You and I are too. You and I are too. Babylon is alive and well, I would argue, and it is raging. And in case you haven't noticed, it is opposed to everything that we stand for. And just like the pressure that the original Babylon put on Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, modern day Babylon is going to pressure us to bow our knees to the golden, golden idols of this generation and to swear allegiance to the kings and rulers who are ruling at this hour in world history. The question, the question is, will we do it? Or will we have the courage of those that have come before us that we will revere the Lord and fear the Lord and fear no man, fear no threat, but proclaim what the one true God proclaim his gospel of his son crucified and risen to this generation. Will we do it? I can tell you this much. The Christians who have the courage to stand strong in the face of the pressures of Babylon will no doubt, not only the Christians, the churches, the homes, whatever, those people and those institutions and those homes that stand strong will be those people who ultimately fear the Lord and revere his name. Folks, you set, apart heart, you set apart Christ in your heart and you keep him set apart. Amen? We serve one. We fear one. Reverent people do courageous things. They always have and they always will. And can I prove it to you? Think about this passage just briefly. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Folks, you think we're living in a wicked time? Babylon has always been raging. Babylon was so bad in the time of Noah that God's gonna wipe it out with a flood. That's how bad it was then. And yet there's a man who so reveres God and fears God and reveres and fears what God has warned about that Noah courageously undertook a massive building project that took anywhere from 50 to 70, 75 years to complete. Do you understand? I mean, that's incredible. Imagine undertaking building an ark. It's going to take you 50 to 75 years to build. You're going to be probably mocked and ridiculed, but because you fear the Lord, you do it. You see, that's what reverent people do. They're the type of people that change families, change communities, change states, change countries, change the world. See, the pressing question for each of us here today is simply this. Who or what do you truly revere? Who have you set apart or what have you set apart in your heart? 1 Peter 3.15, but set apart Christ in your heart and always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. But that verse starts by saying, set apart Christ in your heart. You see, the answer to this question, by the way, will not be found in the words that come out of your mouth, but the decisions that you make in this generation. You can say that you fear the Lord, but you are going to be presented with opportunities, no doubt. Probably even some of us here today are going to experience it because we live in a wicked world. You are going to be faced with opportunities to put your words into actions. Many Christians, as well as churches that we once considered strong, have been exposed as incredibly weak. Why is that? It's very simple. They have come to fear men more than they fear the Lord. They have come to revere the praise of men more than the praise of God. Let's commit to be Christians that don't do that and a church that doesn't do that. Amen? Amen. Listen, if the Lord doesn't come back in this generation, I hope he does, but if he doesn't, who knows? Maybe the believers a hundred years from now will marvel at the courage we showed here and now. 